All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 26th of, Oct of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. I'm currently in the process, well, YouTube's in the process of processing. Well, they got slow computers there, <laughs> or they're just busy. Um, on a video, somebody had done a video, perhaps influenced by some things I have said, that... Uh, uh, because I focused on some difficulties with Calvinism. <laughs> yeah. Now, when Calvinism, Calvinism can become a heresy when you emphasize certain things that aren't biblical uh, or you can't demonstrate from the Scripture and don't emphasize what God emphasizes. Doesn't Usually it's not heretical, but it can become. Like everything can become, and I want to go into that a little bit. Anyway, this guy just doesn't understand what Calvinism is. It takes you, it took me a couple of years to get a handle on it, really, uh, partially from inside, to get a handle on what it really is and to understand what people were saying. Yeah, some people are actually saying that, and that's a problem. Uh, and to understand the, the, the logic behind it and everything else. Um uh, but people might just take what I say and just don't know what how, the context of that. So what I want to say a little bit about is uh, generalize how you might know a heresy. Uh, the Christian walk, Jesus said, the way is narrow. The gate is narrow and the way is constricted. You know, in, in a Christian walk, it's sort of like there's a, a narrow ridge you're walking down with Christ, and there's a precipice on both sides, steep drop-off, like a mountain ridge. And the Satan's always there trying to shove you over the edge, one side or the other. Oh, yeah, but Christ is always there, too, grabbing you like Peter. Oh, Lord, bid me to come to you on the water. Oh, this is interesting. Hey, wait a minute. I can't walk on water. Shoot. And I stopped walking by faith and started walking by sight is what happened. But uh, there, we have adversaries in this world that always want to shove us off away from Christ and get us focused on the wrong thing, and that's when we go over the edge. Yeah. Um, but there are some basic principles, and there's basic truth that I want to focus on. Uh, the, F the fundamentalist movement's an uh, uh, example of this, too. It started out simply holding fast to the historic fundamentals of the Christian faith in, uh, in the face of opposition, a lot of opposition that was coming from within the church. Liberalism, textual criticism, uh, uh, higher criticism, uh, it starts with textual criticism, but criticism by the way, uh, attacks on the the uh, bodily resurrection of Jesus, and uh, actually liberalism started. Some uh, in, were trying to save Christianity from secularism. They saw all the uh, things like evolution, and everything else, and said, "Oh, Christianity can't stand in the face of this. We need to retreat into a safe space and basically compromise heavily. Uh, we can't stand for creation uh, uh, and." Uh, uh, direct creation of man by God in the face of, of um, what's his name, <laughs> the evolutionist, not Karl Marx, Darwin, Darwin, Darwin. No, we can't stand against that. That's scientific truth. No, it's not. It was all a lie. Any mathematician could have, well, they didn't know enough. See, one of the problems was ignorance. They didn't know about DNA. They didn't know about what was in a cell. 
how complex a single cell is, how incredibly complex a single cell is. They had no idea. They thought it was just like protoplasmic jelly under their crude optical microscopes. I mean, they could see, well, it's, it's alive, but can't make out any details. We know a whole lot more today, and evolution today is totally in untenable. Uh, just a calculator should tell you that. Start figuring out the odds. Information theory, where the information for the DNA come from? Not the fact that the DNA itself, that's just a recording media. Uh, media. The information on it. Where did it come from? It's, it's, it's insanity. It, it's just people wanting to disprove God. They want, they, they're, they want to hide from God. That's what it is all about. Denying the truth that God's made evident to them. So how do we, how do we uh, diagnose in a world just like uh, the fundamentalists? It was uh, holding fast. You had fundamental, our basic uh, conservative Reformed, Presbyterians, Baptists, and others, mostly the Reformed, in fact, as far as they were the intellectual core, and in evangelicals, if you don't find any, uh, say, Baptists, or old-time Methodists, too, as far as uh, shaping the thinking of evangelicalism, uh, no. No, 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 no. They don't do thinking. They don't do thinking. Now we're in revivalism. It was just a strong influence in, of revivalism in the. So you had, uh, but there, the, the Baptist fundamentalist movement, it was, it, it didn't have an intellectual core. It was just, these are the fundamentals. We're going to hold to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fight, fight, fight. Um, that's pretty much what it was. There was no, and you had demagogues. You know? <laughs> so, now, that's one of the weaknesses with uh, with Baptists in America. They really don't have any brains. <laughs> they didn't have any brains. I'm pointing my finger at myself. Um, I wasn't raised as Baptist, though. As you know, I was raised as a Lutheran. Do Lutherans have brains? I've heard some intelligent ones. I don't know what they if they know what they're talking about, but no, it's uh, really you had major influences like Machen and others that were that were writing books about the inspiration of the Scripture and uh, the Virgin Birth. They were defending the faith strongly, and the Baptists were out there screaming and hollering. Think of Jimmy, uh, not Jimmy Swaggart. There's another uh, Jerry Falwell and the. Uh, his crusade, his anti-pornography crusade, uh, that, that he compromised everything for a political movement, for moralism. Now, and the, the Baptist fundamentalists became very compromised, too. They couldn't maintain the center. They couldn't maintain a focus on what was important. They went off into cultural crusades very quickly. A prohibitionism, you know, the American Hol the Holiness Code, not just holiness religion, holiness period. Baptists, too. No alcohol, no this, no that, no whatever, no cards, no movies, no smoking, no da 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 da. Does that come from the Bible? Absolutely not. Uh, it is really like Michael Horton wrote a book, I think it was uh, 20, uh, 2008, entitled Christless Christianity. And that's what a lot of American religion, including fundamentalism and evangelicalism, has been Christless Christianity. Christianity. And that is a heresy. That is apostasy. It's forgetting Christ. So what do we have to hold? What is the center? I mean, there's lots of things you can be wrong on. There are core fundamentals. The core is Christ himself, who he is and what he did, and how that benefits us. How can we plug ourselves into God's salvation in Christ? Christ himself, and that includes you know, that he is the Word, he is God, God became flesh, dwelled among us, he was incarnate in the Virgin Mary, virgin birth is a fundamental of the faith, a necessary one, and uh, lived a sinless life, died a, a penal, substitutionary, uh, vicarious, which is the same as substitutionary, death 
on a cross for the sins of the world. Of course, there can be you. You can say particular redemption or general redemption. It doesn't. That is not the issue. One's biblical, one's not. But that is not the issue. The issue is what he accomplished for those who, especially for those who believe in him. What did he say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes, that's close enough, in him, whoever is a believer in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. Okay. And then he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and he's sitting there until he comes again. And he's coming again. Okay. Christ is the center, he has to remain the center. Then there's other doctrines like the verbal or the inspiration of Scripture, authority of Scripture, that people always want to stretch farther than, than they need to. Okay, Because the Scripture tells us who Christ is, and it is God has spoken to us in the Scripture, and if we refuse to believe the Scripture, we ref refuse to believe God. But, but you can have doubts about certain things in the Bible, and still be saved, as long as you're right on Christ. I mean, you might have a hard time because you've been so soaked in the world in believing that God created the heavens and earth in six days. And, oh, yeah, yeah, the yom can mean a period of time. Yes, it can. Okay. Six, a six, being a six-day creationist is not, does not save you, nor does it necessarily damn you. Uh Having difficulties with some of Scripture doesn't prevent you from being saved. You have to be right on Christ. That's the essential. But these other things that are around that, like the authority and inerrancy of Scripture, infallibility, I don't care what, doesn't matter. People get uh, all fussy about certain words that aren't biblical anyway. Scripture is God-breathed. All right, so... Um, and some other doctrines, you know, people could argue about the uh, eschatology, the end times, when it happens, how it happens, what these things mean. That is not essential to Christianity. It's sort of like um, uh, the, the old school Lutheran church that I visited. They've got all kinds of things, that the, the clerical garments and the liturgy, and very traditional but all those things are dispensable. What you can't dispense with is Christ and him crucified and Christ risen from the dead and salvation by grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone. If you trust in Christ, you're going to believe what he says. You're going to believe his apostles. And what does Jesus and the apostles say about the Old Testament? You know, you, you, can work, you work it out from that center, from the center of Christ, if you have doubts about these things. And God himself will testify to you if you're born again. But just like the, the what became the fundamentalist movement, which was a series of books, it was really a whole bunch of essays on uh, the attacks and on the fundamentals of genuine Christianity. And again, it was a cross-denominational movement. It was just Christians holding to the historic center of Christianity without getting, but it people got away from that. It's just like the Baptist fundamentalists got into prohibition and all kinds of, trying to fix the world rather than paying attention to Christ. Things haven't changed. The woke movement. Liberalism was an attempt to save Christianity from the onset of modern science and all the attacks there by compromise. Fundamentalists said, no, we have to hold to the fundamentals and not compromise Christ and him crucified, especially. And the authority of Scripture, which is our, the witness of Christ and him crucified, the witness of the apostles and the prophets. Throw, undermine that, and you don't have any testimony of Christ. It's nothing but tradition, then. There is no authority. So that's that's what happened then, and that's what happened today. Rather than 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 say the Baptists going off crazy into the to, to the temperance prohibitionist movement, 
which was a huge waste of time and listening to professional baseball players rather than to Christ battling against the forces of evil in society. Well, guess what? That's a learning, losing battle because the world is damned. It's going, to, it's going to be done away with eventually. We're here. Uh, we have been saved out of the world, and that's why the church is remaining in the world, is to call people to Christ and call them out of the world onto Christ. That is the important thing. If you lose, if you don't keep the most important thing, the most important thing, then you get into heresy and, and apostasy. So let's go to the scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 21, I guess. This is the New King James. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not, no God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called by God, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, Christ crucified. Christ, 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 Christ. That must be the center. And that traditional, when I heard the preacher down there in that pastor in that traditional uh, Lutheran church, he was keeping Christ centered. And the music was like somebody had selected it for its content, not like this frivolous garbage you hear so many places. It was about Christ and worshiping Christ, the greatness of God, and what God has done in Christ. It was refreshing. Now, they're sectarian, that's a problem. But, I mean, if you are... If you are trusting in Christ and Christ's finished work on the cross for you, holding to that, then you are a Christian. That is the core. Who, of course, you have to know who Christ is, what he did, and that by faith in him and his work, we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's it. That is the core. That is all you really need. The other stuff is important in layers of importance as you go out farther and farther from the center. You know, the authority of the scriptures. It's important, but you can have questions about some things and it doesn't you're not lost because of that. As long as you're holding to Christ. You have some weird ideas. We all have some weird ideas. Um, can't understand some things. That's not the issue. Christ is the issue. Of course, you have to have the Christ of the Bible, not some phony Christ, not some fake Christ, not the Christ of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That thing can't save anybody. So what are errors? Anything that substitutes for Christ and Christ crucified as a center, moves it, the attention away from that, or takes him completely out of the scene. This is not only heresy, this is apostasy. Because it's not about, there, there's, there's like one paragraph in here on Christ, you know, to, to get right with God. You say this prayer after me, and if you're sincere, you're going to heaven. Heaven, welcome to the kingdom. That's Rick Warren's theology. Rick Warren is an apostate. Well, no, he's not an apostate. I don't believe Rick Warren has never been saved. Never saved. He is not a Christian, period. This book is not about Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's about you. How to have uh, satisfy yourself by finding your purpose in life 
and it was endorsed by such people as Billy and Franklin Graham. There's two people with a lot of discernment. Bruce Wilkerson, author of The Prayer of Jabez. Most people probably don't know what that book was. It was abominable. There's another example of heretic. Uh, so if, if Billy... What, what did Billy and, and Franklin say? I don't know. Do they... Uh, well, they're, they are Southern Baptists, and so is, so is uh, uh, Rick Warren, a Southern Baptist, and thou shalt not say anything evil about your, your fellow Southern Baptists. Billy Graham, who got baptized a third time as a Southern Baptist in order to increase the potential of his ministry. Ah, that doesn't, you know, that strikes me really bad. <sighs> so, yeah, Max Lucado, oh, there's another winner. Lee Strobel, author of The Case for Christ. Well, he's sort of gone off the rails now, too. If there's only, well, I'll read what Lee Strobel says here, randomly, just sort of picking him. If you only read one book on what life is all about, make it this one, exclamation point. This book is life-changing, all that in bold. Rick Warren is absolutely brilliant at explaining our real purpose on earth and stating profound truths in simple ways. Give this book to everyone you care about. Believe me, you'll never be the same after reading this. What a gift. I, yes, I would say, if you read this and believe this, well, you've just sold out to Satan. This book is not about Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not about salvation from sin. It's all about finding your purpose and happiness through finding your purpose. <sighs> It's not about your purpose. It's about God's purpose in Christ. This man, it's evident he's never, not saved. I mean, say this prayer, and if you were sincere, now welcome to the kingdom of God. This man has no understanding of salvation at all. Simple, except when I first read it, after avoiding it for years, I had to go to God in prayer to find out what's going on with this book. Because when I read it, I couldn't fought. I was looking for specific things were, that were obviously heretical, like denying Christ, denying the authority of Scripture. I came away and I said, Lord, I, I can't put my finger on it. I know this book is terrible, but I can't say why. And then suddenly I, thought, I had the thought. How does this thought didn't come from me? I'm not going to take credit for it. I'm not that smart. How does Rick Warren handle the scripture? And I look, oh, oh. And as I looked in there, yes, he is an absolute twister of the Bible, just like Satan. Twists it. Takes it out of context, uses junk translations, to say what he wants to say and tries to give authority to his corrupt, self-centered, ungodly message, man-centered, by twisting the Word of God to say what Rick Warren wants to say. Demonstrates what he is right there. Son of Satan. So we're going to go. I'm going through these books. I'm not going into the details, but I want to show you the, the degrees. So Rick Warren should have been, you know, he's like like Joel Osteen and people like that, the Prosperity Gospel, um, Copeland, Kenneth Copeland, you know. If you can't see that they're not preaching Christ and him crucified, you can't think that, see what, that they're, what they're doing is not Christianity, well, you're blind. You're, you're not regenerate yourself. You don't have eyes to see the kingdom. Uh, level of that now this is much more deceptive. 
Although the front cover isn't, Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. So Piper is nice in that he comes out right in the, in the beginning and tells you exactly what he is and why he is a hedonist, which indeed he is, because it's all about Piper's lifelong quest and the mission of his ministry is to, to because all people want to be happy, he says, quoting some pagans, heretics, unbelievers, as far as biblically. Uh, yeah, all men, all in Adam. <laughs> that That's a flash. Please your flash. That's a true statement about sinners. And in Adam, all have sinned. So he, he uses that as a foundation. And then he tries to use God to satisfy his, his lust for personal happiness. Uses God for his personal ends. I mean, it's in your face. But you might not see it. A lot of people haven't. That this is much more... Piper has a brilliant mind. And he was able to deceive himself brilliantly and others along with it. He thinks he's really God's gift to mankind. I mean... But his, his theology is poison. It's self. It's flesh. It's pleasing your flesh. It's using God to satisfy your corrupt desires. To be happy. A lust for happiness. I had this overwhelming desire to be happy. That's called lust. A strong desire is what lust is. And if it wasn't an overwhelming desire to know God or to be delivered from my sin... No, my personal happiness. I want to be happy. And I fig I heard some people that aren't really Christians like C.S. Lewis and Blaise Pascal tell me that, that that's fine and that, that it's really everybody ought to seek their own happiness. That's, that's really what it's all about. And God will help you do that. that. No. You can use God to achieve your own ends. No, that's called sorcery. Uh so that's in the next. That's this is harder to discern than Rick Warren, and Rick Warren deceived millions and millions and millions of not only people in the pews but pastors. The entire Southern Baptist denomination. Uh, John Piper, not nearly as wild, wildly known, but. Uh, if you manage to get past the introduction, you shouldn't get past the introduction. He tells you right where he's coming from in the introduction. If you haven't thrown the book across the room yet, you're in serious danger. The more you, you don't see, if you got if you're in a book that you know is bad, you gotta be careful. You gotta keep yourself distanced from it. Otherwise it'll start leaking into you. You'll be contaminated by it. Spiritually contaminated. One of the reasons for that, if you know it's wrong and you start digging and digging and digging into it and you're not, you know, wearing your 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 special suit to protect you from error, you know, your your medical gear, uh except it's like, like the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, that kind of suit. And you're doing it for a godly reason. It, it, it's dangerous to play with the devil's toys, the devil's people. Uh, I don't believe John Piper, based on the introduction and what he continues to say, I'd say John Piper has never been saved. Never been saved. Not out of animus, it's just that he manifests the flesh, and nothing but the flesh. His whole ministry is about the flesh, using God to please yourself, to be happy. Well, being a Christian isn't about being happy. In fact, uh, like, like Paul makes it clear, being, and Jesus makes it clear, it's about being miserable more often than being happy. Taking up your cross... Jesus was talking about literal crucifixion, by the way. And going up your hill with up that hill with him, that's not about your happiness. 
Your flesh don't like that. Okay. Next in the order, and the final one I'm going to deal with, that's really quick here. Deceptiveness. John MacArthur. John MacArthur. This is another man I would hesitate to call a brother in Christ. I, as Piper, they say all the, they're preachers' kids. Uh, they know all the right words. They they know they're say, supposed to say this. They know they're supposed to believe that. They could rattle off probably the Apostles' Creed, uh, or the, maybe the Ten Commandments or whatever. Know the the fundamentals of the faith. They can rattle them off. But is Christ in them? Is Christ, when they took, is Piper's book, here, let's go back a bit. Is this book about Jesus Christ and him crucified, Christ risen from the dead, Christ dying for our sins that we might be reconciled to a holy God? Is it about that? Absolutely not. No way, Jose. Is this book about that? No. Absolutely not. It's about your happiness. How to use God to be happy. It's not about Christ and him crucified. Not about his penal substitutionary atonement. It's about being a Christian, the, the, man, the mandate to be a Christian hedonist. About to live for God for your own pleasure. Does the Bible teach that at all? No. What happens to people that follow Christ? They're persecuted. They can get killed. They suffer. In this world, you have tribulation. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. It's not about being happy. It's about being saved from your sin and from the just punishment of it. It's about being reconciled to a holy God. It's about becoming a child of God. It's not about happiness. You should be more concerned about whether God's happy or not. It's not about, you know, why should you even be concerned about your own happiness? What does that have to do with your relationship with God? Is God your servant? Yeah, some people say so. The pastor I just abandoned. Yeah, yeah Christ came to serve us. I don't think so came to serve the Father, the, the, the one that denies penal substitutionary atonement. I thought there's something really not right here. Well, there, were, there it was. But it, I, I, I went for a year before it got the, the bucket of drip, 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 got to the point where I got to look into this. Something's really wrong. And sure enough, I find out, out the, the man does not hold to one of the, the central Doctrines of Christianity, Christ's penal substitutionary atonement. Anybody that does not hold to that, flee. If that's not what they're about, it was I wasn't hearing it being preached. Of course, you can go to a whole lot of fundamental Baptist churches, and you'll if you hold your breath until it's preached, they're going to take you out of there in a coroner's wagon. I've been a lot of places, heard a lot of Baptist preachers, fundamentalist Baptist preachers, a lot of preachers of all kinds. I remember one place when I was, when I was doing uh, the head of the video department down at Rio Grande Bible Institute. They brought in a new preacher. We had, I think, chapel, what, a couple times a week? So it was, uh, and they'd have a, a new preacher there almost every day, every, 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 um, every time for chapel, um, Spanish preacher fundamentalist Baptist generally and if you had to hold your breath waiting for Christ and Christ crucified to be preached uh, you'd be nothing but a skeleton in the chair thoroughly rotted and dustified cobwebs hanging all over you okay so that's the test is Christ the center is it all about Christ and his work and his salvation or is it something else? John MacArthur. The gospel according to Jesus, that's about everything but the gospel according to Jesus. What it's about? It's about the, the parables of Jesus. 
It's about the law. It's about uh, d what being a Christian demands. Like take up your cross. Now those things are the fruit of salvation, not the cause. Piper or MacArthur has it backwards. He indeed is a heretic because he is preaching a salvation by works. A lot of Reformed people preach a salvation by works. Douglas Wilson preaches a salvation by works. N.T. Wright, Anglican, salvation by works. John Piper, salvation by works. Not by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Faith is sufficient. Faith in Jesus Christ, the Christ of the Bible, and what he did is sufficient. The works are really God's works, and they're produced in you because of what God does in you. The, the willingness to follow, to take up a cross and follow Christ to your death is the fruit of God's work in you. It's what he gives you, the love for Christ, the love for God. The faith and the faithfulness to do that, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. As, demand, as required by the circumstances. It is not you, it's God. John MacArthur does not understand the gospel either. You will not find, with, with Rick Warren and John Piper and John MacArthur, none of them have a testimony of salvation. None of them. None of them. That's why Rick Warren says, say this prayer. He has no idea what it is. Apparently he's never been convicted of a sin by the Holy Spirit and never been moved, dragged by the Holy Spirit to Christ. Never saw his need. That's why he can sacrifice everything, a purpose-driven church. You know, he's... In this abomination, how to turn your church into a secular whorehouse. That's what it is. Oh, he talks about the importance of music. That's why we do rock and roll at, uh, at whatever the name of his place is. And all the things, it's all about pleasing the world. Grow your church through pleasing the world. Yeah, growth without compromising your message, not Christ's message. Christ's message isn't in this book at all, either. This preceded the Purpose Driven Life, by the way. This goes back to, what's the date in this one? I remember seeing it in a bookstore. I looked at it like four or five times. I couldn't buy it. The Holy Spirit would not allow me to buy it. This one is copyrighted 1995. I might be wrong. I thought this was actually predated the... Uh, I'm corrected. It, it doesn't predate. It postdates the Purpose Driven Life, I believe, which came out when... Let's check here. 1995 for the Purpose Driven Church. I thought that was first. But there was a whole bunch of people there with the with the seeker-sensitive stuff, remember? Maybe you don't remember. 2002, it did predate. It did. Now, this is 2002, and this is 1995. Okay, but uh, John MacArthur's The Gospel According to Jesus is not the Gospel According to Jesus. Where do you find the Gospel According to Jesus? John 3.16. John chapter 3. That's where the gospel according to Jesus is. In the gospels, really. You might find smatterings of it here and there. Even then, it's not clearly presented because Christ hadn't been crucified yet. His ministry was under the law. He himself was born under the law. The Sermon on the Mount is mostly about the law and what the law really teaches. 
And the purpose of the law is what? To show you you're a sinner. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. For through the law is the knowledge of sin. So John MacArthur, it's not about, this is not about the gospel of Jesus Christ. John MacArthur preaches the Bible, but so what? You can preach the Bible all day long, not preach Christ crucified. It disp anytime the, the emphasis is taken off Christ and Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead, and salvation by faith in him, it's not the gospel. It's not, it's not the church. The church gathers in his name and his name alone. That's why sectarianism is a sin. That's why cre uh, confessionalism is a sin. Because it takes the, 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 we're to gather in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you belong to Christ? Do you believe in the biblical Christ and the biblical gospel? Are you following him? That is a basis. He is the basis for our gathering together. He is our koinonia, our fellowship. And if you substitute something else, it's heretical. Gathering together in some other name or some other for some other purpose is not Christianity. Calling yourself a Christian and promoting some other gospel is not Christianity. It's heresy. Again, I don't believe that my personal opinion, based on what I've read in their material, is that uh, <clears throat> Rick Warren and John Piper and John MacArthur are not born-again believers. Because their focus isn't on Christ and Him crucified. I can't find in any of them any kind of a, a testimony about being convicted of sin uh, by the Holy Spirit and then finally finding a right relationship with God, being justified through faith in Christ, believing that Christ died for my sins, paid the full price, and then he rose from the, from the dead, indicating that my sins actually had been atoned for. If he, had, if he hadn't fully atoned for sin, because our sin was put upon him, imputed to him, whatever language you want to use there, he couldn't have risen without paying the full penalty. So when somebody comes along and it, they distort, the, they, take, they take that out of there and have Christ not doing that, that's not Christianity. The, the Nazarene church, the pastor there, the governmental theory of atonement, instead of penal substitutionary atonement, he, Christ, paying my penalty, no way. Once, that, once I narrowed it down, I said, what do you believe? I had to confront him. I said, that's it. And if you got a, a church that meets to, to promote a particular movement, a particular doctrine, other than Christ and him crucified, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. That goes about for Pentecostals, Charismatics, uh, Holiness churches, any kind of a church that promotes something, the main thing is something other than Christ and him crucified. There's all kinds of special purpose-driven churches, but the purpose isn't God's purpose. When Christ and him crucified is not central, what are you going to? Why are you attending there? So I hope that will help. Very simple way to tell if it's of God or not. As the scripture reveals, Let's go over and close this with John, 1 John. Let's close it with scripture here. Whoever transgresses or trespasses or goes too far and does not abide, remain in the doctrine of Christ. He does not have God. So when you pick up a book and it's not about... And the author does not abide. Now, you can have a, 
I don't want to say that some, because somebody writes a book about something other than Christ and him crucified, they're not a Christian. No, no, these are, this is Piper's lifelong ministry. Same about Rick Warren. Same about John MacArthur. All kinds of books, not about Christ and him crucified. It's not, it's not the center of their ministry. And these are teachers. They're held to a higher standard. Okay? I'm not picking on a person in the pew. I'm picking on the teachers, the pastors. If you're a pastor and you don't believe in penal substitutionary atonement, now, technically, all three of these people would say, yes, I believe in that. Because that's what they have to say. That's what they, you know... But is to, just to believe in a doctrine as a doctrine and to hold to Christ and what he did and know it, to know that he died for my sins are different things. People can say a lot of things. But as, as James points out, there are people that have say-so faith but their life shows something else. They show that they believe something other than that, really. See, that's what the works that James is talking about. Their, their, their life does not manifest true faith in Jesus Christ. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ, remember, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine of abiding in Christ and what Christ is, what he's accomplished, you know, what the Bible teaches about him and God's salvation in Christ, do not receive him into your house or greet him. Those Jehovah's Witnesses, those Mormons, or somebody else that does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, do not receive them. Do not greet them. Rebuke them. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. If you welcome the apostate, the heretic, the enemy of the gospel, you're welcoming God's enemy, the enemy of Christ. That's what that's talking about. So you can have all kinds of errors. But when you're wrong about Christ... You're wrong about everything. And this is how you can tell a good church from a bad church, a good preacher from a bad teacher, preacher, teacher, whatever. Error from truth. One of the tests that John talks about in his first epistle. That the one that goes beyond the bounds crosses the line, and does not abide, does not remain in the doctrine of Christ. So he goes off onto other things. It doesn't mean just contradicting. It means leaving the doctrine of Christ for other things, like saving society, saving the world, bringing America back to God, back to the God of the founding fathers, the God of deism. Uh, things like that. Uh, a preacher that, that uh, fighting abortion. That's not focusing on Christ and Him crucified. People get, that get saved don't abort their children. If you want to fight abortion? Get people saved. But that's not really God's agenda. The God's agenda is salvation not fighting against the evils of sinners. Stop trying to dress up the sinful tree and decorate it. 
lay an axe to its roots. Cut it down. That's what happens when you get saved. You become a new creature in Christ. And God will discipline you. Definitely. So don't don't embrace, don't support, don't do anything to aid those who claim to be Christians but don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, especially teachers, preachers, evangelists, book writers. See, when you bring a book to the pulpit other than the Bible, and it's, it's written to please the flesh or it's the wisdom of the world or whatever, you are putting your arm around that author and saying, this is my good buddy. He's so good. I'd rather have you listen to him than listen to God's word. That's what I heard Sunday. A preacher do that. He didn't literally say that, but that's by what he's doing before the congregation He's telling the congregation every time he does that that this is not sufficient. This is not sufficient. Oh, by the way, if somebody's a King James onlyness, onlyist and that's what their thing is all about, that's what they're always talking about, a particular translation of the Bible, they're one of these false teachers too. Because they're not focusing on Christ and him crucified either. You can use the Bible as an idol, just like they do, and completely miss the Savior that the book tells us about, the God the book tells us about. Now, when somebody, especially a teacher, takes a focus off Christ and him crucified, and they always want to put the focus on something else, flee from them. They are not servants of God. Do not greet them. Do not give offerings to them. Starve them out. Sanction them. Cut them off. Because they are not serving Christ. They are serving the enemy. And you don't need to help the enemy. I hope that clarifies things a little bit. It's not hard to discern these things. Just listen. What are they focusing on? And especially lately with this Nazarene thing, it's really got me back on, okay, this is a central thing, Christ and him crucified. And if that's not right, if, if they are de-emphasizing Christ, it's like that making entire sanctification or personal holiness or, or missions or anything. They take the focus off him for some something else. Alarm bells should be going off. Red flags should be going off because there's something wrong. It's not Christ and him crucified. He is our salvation. He is our fellowship. We don't have fellowship with people that don't belong to Christ, aren't in love with Christ, a love that God gives you. <sighs> anyway, I hope that that should help you to discern, you know, what is essential and what's not. There's a lot of things where we all err in many ways, but you can't miss Christ. You can't take the focus off him, ever. And I fear many, many, many fundamentalist and evangelical churches of all stripes and denominations often have put the focus on something other than Jesus Christ. And that's not just exception, but the norm. The norm. And their churches are about pleasing sinners rather than preaching Christ. 